Hey, this is Wayne Pond, formerly of Soundings from the National Humanities Center. You're lucky. You're listening to U.S. Modernist Radio. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. I'm Tom Guild. Nowhere in the world celebrates modernism better than Modernism Week in Palm Springs, California. Every February, they have a huge architecture and design festival. And for the last five years, U.S. Modernist has been there interviewing nearly all of Modernism Week's keynote speakers, plus special guests at the U.S. Modernist Compound, a.k.a. Poolside, at the very swanky Hotel Skylark. Almost all the famous names in the pantheon of mid-century modern architecture are, well, they're guys, males, a function of the widely held but false belief that there weren't many women interested in architecture. Plus, the sad but true fact that these women were marginalized by the profession, their colleagues, and the media. George Smart meets with Libby Otto and Jane Hall, two authors discussing amazing women in architecture we don't know about and why we should. I'm Tom Guile. This year at Modernism Week, I really enjoyed seeing Sunnylands. That's the, uh, you don't know about it, it's the Walter Annenberg Estate. Walter published TV Guide and a few other things. I guess the guy had money, but it was built mm, a little ways out of town, and it is this massive compound with golf courses and landscaping and a fantastic main structure that uh, most U.S. presidents have used as a meeting place. It was known as the Western White House. And, I don't, George, who designed Sunnylands? Do you know? That was Quincy Jones. Oh, yeah. And Walter and his wife, Leonore, wanted to set up a really nice, secure facility where heads of state could meet and relax and talk about world peace and other issues. Oh, yeah. Well, they succeeded big time. We had a really great time at Modernism Week this year. If you're into mid-century modern, going to Modernism Week is a totally joyous, all-you-can-view festival of mid-century architecture, incredible houses, brilliantly curated tours, detailed art and architecture exhibits, martinis, parties, and much more. One highlight this year for me was going to Copley's Restaurant, which is on the old Cary Grant estate there. It's a beautiful restaurant. About three quarters of it is outdoors in this giant courtyard, and about one quarter, one third of it is indoors. And most nights in Palm Springs are absolutely beautiful. So you can have a great meal and enjoy the outdoors and feel a little bit of that Hollywood vibe. It was fabulous. If you'd like to go with us in February 2021 and stay at the U.S. Modernist Compound, here's a typical day. You're going to get up. You're going to have a great breakfast. You're going to tour. You're going to have some private tours. You're going to have some exclusive tours. You're going to have some tours that we go on with other people. And then you're going to need some lunch because you got to recover from the tours. And then you're going to probably need a nap because you're going to need to recover from lunch. And then it's time to gear up because it's party time starting at five o'clock where you'll go to some reception at an amazing modernist house. You'll come back. Maybe you'll have dinner. Maybe you won't, but you'll sit by the fire pit, chat with your friends, have a drink from our bar, and then head off to bed. And the next day, you're going to do it all over again. It's pretty fabulous. It really is. If you'd like to go, email me at george at usmodernist.org. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by nichiha.com slash usmodernist and by modernist realtor Angela Roll. In her ongoing fictional life, resourceful Angela Roll was out of money on the streets of Paris. She only had five trusted friends, Jada, a computer expert, Al May, an expert at makeup and disguises, Yonat, an acrobat and former Mossad agent, Baby G, a former adult entertainer turned rapper, and her Aunt Jennifer, who made lunch. Angela managed to mastermind a midnight heist from a Pan Am 747 at Charles de Gaulle Airport, stealing a rare limited edition Banksy in her bright yellow Mini Cooper S, John Cooper Works Edition. Days later, driving through the streets of Monte Carlo, she was chased by Interpol detective Eric Von Roll and his twin brothers, Kaiser and Chibata Roll, (laughs) who nearly captured her. 
but she escaped by jetpack because all heroines have one and came to America to become a real estate agent specializing in modernist houses. Now Angela advises buyers and sellers on everything from appropriate renovation to turning off that annoying shredding feature on your bank seat. Reach her at AngelaRoll.com, that's R-O-E-H-L, or call her at 919-995-0550. Thank you, Tom. My first guest, Libby Otto, is an art historian and associate professor at the University of Buffalo, where she also served as the executive director of the Humanities Institute. An expert in the Bauhaus, gender and photography, also media culture, she is the author or co-author of five books, including Bauhaus Women, A Global Perspective, and her talk at Modernism Week was Haunted Bauhaus, Spirit, Sex, and Politics in the Design School You Thought You Knew. Later on, I talked with Jane Hall, author of Breaking Ground, Architecture by Women. Let's go poolside to the Hotel Skylark in Palm Springs. I understand you spent some time near my house, about three miles away in the National Humanities Center. When was that? That was, uh, I was there two years ago right now for nine months, and it was fantastic. I am a big fan of that area. And the National Humanities Center, you stay there for what, three months or a year? How does it work? I was there for an academic year, so a whole school year, which means a year off of teaching. And all that they ask of their fellows is one five-minute presentation on your work. The rest, they want you to be working. If you want to be in a reading group, you can be in a reading group. You can do whatever you want, but there are very few demands, which is part of how I got quite a lot of writing done. And I understand lunch is pretty good. I've been out there for lunch a couple times. Lunch is excellent. (laughs) Lunch is excellent. Right. They do, they like you to be around for lunch and they feed you. So yeah, yeah, it's great. It, It makes, builds a great community. And I think it made my scholarship more adventuresome because it's a place where scholars that are doing all different kinds of projects come together. And over lunch, you can say, ah, I'm having trouble with this. And someone will say, have you heard of this book? Or have you thought of this idea? Or it sounds like, you know, you're really interested in this more than that other thing you're trying to do. And so it's really a great place to be. And it's in a modernist building. It sure is. It sure is a rather brutal modernist building. Mm -hmm. Um, I love it. It's, uh, you know, I find it light and airy, but in the words of one of my fellow fellows, uh, Laura Murphy, we were in London together recently, and there was a similar light and airy modern building, uh, the Isacom building that is based on the Bauhaus, actually. And I, you know, showed her these pictures. I was ecstatic. And she looked at me and said just what she would have said about the National Humanities Center. I love it that you love that ugly building. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's like saying someone... I love that you love your husband, but... (laughs) Right, right, right. right. Almost like it's sort of someone has to, so... Yeah, right. I think someone might say that about the National Humanities Center. Um, But I I like it a lot. Now, your area of expertise, and it is vast, uh, as I've read through your CV and your books and your articles and everything, is about the Bauhaus. So let's start off telling our listeners a little bit about what the Bauhaus was in general, and then we'll get into the area that you've been researching. Sure, yeah. So the Bauhaus was an experimental art school that existed in Germany from 1919 to 1933, not coincidentally the same years as Germany's Weimar Republic, its first democracy, a time when women get the vote, uh, when they did not have prohibition as we did in this country, Mm -hmm. and they really kind of let culture rip. Um, And the Bauhaus was... It's remembered as an architecture school. They didn't actually teach architecture within the school until 1927, but it was always directed by architects, and it drew a lot of people interested in architecture, and they could take classes uh, at neighboring schools and work with the director. Um, And the mission of the Bauhaus was to unite initially art and craft to do away with what the first director, Walter Gropius, called the arrogant barrier between fine art and craft so that everything would be respected and you could work towards a total work of art, which would be the building and all of its interior parts. Over time, as kind of all of Germany and Europe moved away from an expressionist or handmade aesthetic, the ideal of the school starts to run under the slogan, art and technology, a new unity. So um, that's more the Bauhaus that people might recognize, that it's uh, bent metal furniture, um, a the lot Breuer of glass, chairs. The Breuer right. chairs, yes. Glass, flat roofs, you know, very sleek, very 
very modern. Um, and that school then continues. It's initially in the city of Weimar. It gets kicked out because it's seen as too radical. It goes to Dessau to its own purpose-built building which still stands today, and you mm -hmm. can actually stay overnight in it. Oh, really? Yes, for a very for 40 euros. Um, it's quite affordable. Nice. Have to have a shared bathroom, but, you know, what the things we do for modernism, right? exactly. Right? Um, and then in 1932, the city of Dessau, uh, their government went from uh, pretty left-leaning to a hard turn to the right. It was dominated by Nazis, and they got kicked out of the school. And during the last phase of the school... Under the direction of the architect Mies van der Rohe, uh, the school was in Berlin just for six months. And it was shut down by Nazis and they said, oh, you can reopen it if you kick out any foreign students or teachers, including Vasily Kandinsky, arguably the most famous painter in Europe at the time who was right. on staff. Uh, and the masters, as the teachers were called, said no thank you and closed it themselves. And that is the end of it as a, as a school but it kind of continues then as a diaspora around the world. Well, didn't the Nazis want, you know, their usual enemies kicked out to people who were gay, people who were Polish, people who were, you know, anything different? Sure, yeah. yeah all those folks had to go. Yes, yes, okay. they did. They did. Um, but, you know, one thing that I'm really on to now in my next project is actually, you know, there's everyone sort of says the Bauhaus was considered degenerate, everybody left. In fact, the majority of people stayed and they worked. And uh, some of them just kind of quietly did their thing. But some of them were victims of the Holocaust, but did really interesting work in the meantime, including something like art therapy. That's an artist I can tell you about if you're interested at some point, uh, Friedel Dicker. But some of them were also Nazis. So um, an architect named Fritz Ertel was in charge of some of the construction supervision for Auschwitz, including for gas chambers and crematoria. And he was a member of the SS and he was into it. So, you know, I'm, I'm wary of, I think it's easy, especially around Nazis, right, for us right. to sort of make good guys and bad guys. And one thing that I think is really important is to think about how aesthetic movements have no inherent politics and can be deployed even by Nazis, who sometimes were very conservative, but but they also wanted to appear modern in their way. Now, was Albert Speer, who was considered one of the architects of the Third Reich, was he associated with the Bauhaus at any point? He, um, you know, as I recall, not directly, but he knew some of those architects and certainly had some respect for what they did. But he was never in the movement. But he did eventually then, the Bauhaus building stayed on in Dessau and it gets used... Uh, as a home economics school, it's quite big, so they can do yes, a lot very with it. Large. So uh, it's a home ec school. It's a training school for Nazi officers. And for a while, uh, one of the areas where National Socialist building plans are taking place is in there. And, and it's under Albert Speer okay. uh, in the Bauhaus building. You, you pronounce it so much better than I do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have that NPR pronunciation guide yet. <laughs> you can call it right, yeah. I'll make you one. I'll make you one. <laughs> but let's rewind the tape. So back yeah. in the Bauhaus era, mm -hmm. there are all these uh, men and women, as is historical. The men get most of the credit, but you've written about these amazing women who were very influential at this time. Tell me about some of those women. Yeah. So it's a movement that I often think of as, you know, remembered for five guys. In fact, there were 1,253 people That's a hamburger chain, I think there. we yeah, know. Right, yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> so in my mind, the five guys are Walter Gropius, uh -huh. Marcel Breuer, Vasily Kandinsky, Paul Clay, uh, and, you know, then you can pick one more. Maybe it'd be Oscar Schlemmer. Maybe it'd be Marcel Breuer, right? Because okay. he's so influential here. Or Joseph Albers. But there were, uh, in fact, over 400 women at the school. They make up 37% of the total number of students at the school. And um, they're often, if people know there are women there, they'll often say, well, they were all pushed into weaving. In fact, I've got access to this really great database that colleagues put together in Germany. So we now know that women were in every single workshop and program in the school. They did experience some discrimination. Uh, the first semester... There were slightly more than 50% women who enrolled in the school. It was after World War I. There were more able-bodied right. young women at the time. And Gropius, I, I don't think he was a sexist jerk. I think he was a realist. And he knew that if the school was dominated by women, it wouldn't be taken as seriously by 
a sexist society. So he quietly, and actually it wasn't legal, um, because in the Weimar Constitution, women had equal rights to men. But he quietly, with the other male masters, agreed that they would make it more difficult for the women to get in. So they actually had higher admission standards, which means the school attracted all these really awesome women who did really great stuff. Who were very talented. Right, yeah. And they weren't just weaving baskets. What kind of things were they doing? No, although, you know... The weavers, 27% of them went into the weaving workshop okay. and they made really cool fabric too. They made like stain resistant fabric or, you know, windproof fabric or different things that they were using experimental materials. And um, so they did some cool weaving too, but they uh, were photographers, especially as the school goes on. There's there's actually a communist cell in the school and a lot of women were interested in creating a new kind of image through photography, you know, a technological medium that might be heroicizing of the workers, things like that. One of them, Mar- Mariana Brandt, was head of the metal workshop. She actually created, during her first semester in the metal workshop, a tiny little tea extract pot. Um, this is a t- style of tea we don't do, but you have like very strong tea and then you thin it with some water. And it's silver and ebony. It's about four inches long. And uh, one of them holds the record for the highest price ever paid at auction for a Bauhaus object, which was set in 2007. So, you know, that is a recognizable Bauhaus object, but still in mainstream textbooks, she's usually not included. The metal workshop was one of the most male-dominated divisions, and uh, she didn't know it, but when she got there, they kept giving her all this incredibly boring work to do, hoping she would leave. But she just kept doing it. And later, the men accepted her and joked around and said, yeah, we were trying to get you to quit. Um, The workshop was directed by Laszlo Mohinaj. She became his assistant. And when he left, she became the acting director of it for a year and then left of her own accord, in part because she felt like her leadership was just constantly being challenged and she was sick of it. But, um, you know, meanwhile, she got contracts for the workshop's lighting designs to go into mass production. It was one of the more successful ventures of the Bauhaus. And I have one of those lamps on my desk because they were produced for the rest of the Weimar period. They were produced all through the Nazi years, not under the name Bauhaus, but it's the same lamp. And then they were produced in the GDR. Um, and mine is one of the GDR ones. You know, I bought it for 40 bucks at a flea market, but wow. it works great. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. A good deal there. A good deal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, um, in your book, you have a phrase that clearly will be banned in Mississippi called queer hauntology. What does that mean exactly? That is a, so my book is called Haunted Bauhaus. And for the book, I was reading a lot of uh, a book called Ghostly Matters by okay. Avery Gordon, who's a sociologist. And she's looking at sociology, her discipline, and how, you know, it focuses on certain figures at the expense of others. And she uses the idea of haunting as a way of talking about, as she says, those who show up without any sign of leaving. So now, kind is of this the, like is this like the hidden figures, women in NASA? Yeah, that yeah. idea. It's sort of like that, right? Okay. That you know, there's this whole thing that is there, and NASA wouldn't exist without them. Uh, you know, they are sort of holding it up, but nobody sees them, nobody knows them, and nobody tells their story. Okay. And that's you know, so haunting in general is a way of thinking about these figures who've been pushed to the side. But you know, if you're really paying attention to the to the movement, it doesn't make sense unless you actually turn your gaze and focus on them. Right. And queer hauntology is, um, yeah, well, I'm not sure I've ever been to Mississippi. Um, <laughs> but queer hauntology is a strain of scholarship that looks at um, how queerness is also one of these kinds of threads of culture that is kind of questions the dominant stories we have always, um, because queer people are everywhere, right? And right. Or queer ways of being uh, among straight people, for example, too. So that's a phrase for thinking about that. And that's in my chapter called Queer Bauhaus. Now, the people who were gay at this time in the Bauhaus, was it okay to be out or were you just behaving in a, a gay way that was seen as artistic? I mean, right. how were you positioned as a person, could you be out, for instance? That is a great question, and it's not one that I can 
answer for you definitively because okay. there there are no clear statements by the directorship that say, you know, we believe all people are equal and love is love. You You're know, right. I was looking for that, but it just never turned up. Um, but I was able to find members who are of the Bauhaus who are definitely gay and lesbian, not in the leadership. These are among the students and were certainly accepted at the school. And my guess is that as long as it wasn't too over the top, as long as people of the same gender weren't making out in the classroom, it was okay. Right. I did find... Uh, one case of a student who applied and had qualifications that at that time they usually would have been accepted. The student had already studied a fair bit and um, had good background training and then wrote this letter as a kind of personal CV and says at the end of the letter, uh, since May I have permission from the authorities to wear men's clothing, which I am uh, making use of. Signed, Hans, formerly known Johanna. Ah, uh, okay. And this person was not accepted to the school. And there are no notes on why, but it seems to me that it was probably a case of prejudice on the parts of the masters. All that being said, I think these queer members were doing really interesting experimental work, sometimes, you know, crossing gender boundaries in terms of this one who I speak of, Max Pfeiffer Wattenpool, made a was in the weaving workshop a bit and made a very wonderful rug. And then afterwards, you know, once you're in the Bauhaus, it's kind of like if you're in the military or if you've been to a certain college that, you know, people sought each other out and felt uh, kind of had these circles of affinity. And so with like the photographer Florence Henri and other Bauhaus members, all of whom were gay or lesbian, they were friends for life and they were kind of mixing a Bauhaus aesthetic with their photography or their painting or other other elements and kind of querying the Bauhaus at the same time. I mean, it seemed like uh, among the many, many other elements of the Bauhaus in terms of design, it was okay to be sexual, whichever door you wanted to open of that sexual supermarket and talk about it. And they could take photos of each other, for instance. And, you know, this was at a time where this was, you know, not looked upon favorably by most of the rest of the uptight world. Um, you had Albert Stieglitz doing this out in the, in the Southwest. But, um, Photos of Georgia O'Keeffe. Right. But this whole idea of photographs of people who were not clothed was very controversial. Yeah, yeah. It's complicated, right? Because, you know, so, so there's a, a couple things to think about there. One is that whether or not you consider photography art, and this is changing right around this time because the nude in art is the highest form, but right, nude in paintings, photography right. is porn for right. <laughs> much of the 19th century. Um, and then the other thing to remember is what in Germany gets called the life reform movement, Lebensreform. I did a lot of reading and researching around that because I think we can consider the Bauhaus in some ways a life reform movement. And this goes back into the 19th century in Germany, and it includes ways of eating, hiking, but it also includes nudity. There's a long tradition of nudism in Germany. Um, and little known fact, I was trying to figure out where it came from, and I read a wonderful book called Turning to Nature. I believe the author's name is Michael Howe, and in a footnote there I read that this movement came to Germany from the U.S. and that one of the earliest practitioners was Benjamin Franklin. He was a nudist. Is that not a terrifying thought? Wow. Yeah. Well, I knew he had, he had gone to France. That was his well, hangout right. spot. Yes, you know? and I mean, I mean, the French, once you've been there, you just go around nude half the time, half the right? Half time, right? Yeah, right. right? Yeah. Now, so um, they're interested in the nude as art, partially, they're, but they're also interested in changing life. This has a long tradition in Germany, but World War I was terrible. Terrible um, for Germany. You know, yeah, but also this is a school full of young people. So initially, many of the young men who were studying there were had, had served. And one woman that I was able to document, Gunther Stutzel, uh, a great weaver who ended up in Switzerland, uh, but was originally from Bavaria, she served as a nurse as well. So they had actually seen people around them be killed and, uh, you know, machines doing terrible things. And they're highly invested in making a better world and ideas about living more simply, about, you know, bodies being bodies or also, you know, sex as free love as, you know, I mean, they're kind of hedonistic. That was definitely all a part of it. 
Now, Kirk Douglas died here recently at 103, which leaves, I believe, only one of that era's stars still alive, Olivia de Havilland. Are there any of the Bauhaus women that you covered still alive? No, Um, but I'm old enough to regret that I was young and stupid and didn't at 18 know to take the train from the suburbs of New York City where I lived into the city to you know, meet some of them who were kicking around there. Ksanti Shavinsky was there at least some of the time. But even also people like Marcel Duchamp, I think, was still around there playing chess in Washington Square Uh, Park, I think, during my youth. Okay. So Your misspent youth. I know, I know, (laughs) totally. Not not thinking about the Bauhaus. Um, But there were, let's see... I mean, they're not that far away. So definitely I've been able to talk to uh, children of these people, friends, uh, even a gallerist in Leipzig who, in the GDR, she and her husband, her name is Gisela Schultz, and she and her husband uh, ran one of the first galleries in the GDR that sold Bauhaus things, even though the Bauhaus had been kind of maligned in the East. So I was able to to talk to her about what some of these people were like. They weren't all nice, I yeah. figured out. Yeah. I've realized sometimes people are really good artists and not necessarily great people. In any profession, yeah, right? it's true. Now, the Bauhaus, for as long as I've ever heard the phrase uttered, gets mentioned kind of like Woodstock by people in architecture. It's that thing that they know that happened way back that was really cool and people were doing this great stuff. And it gets kind of mythologized over time. What are some of the the misconceptions about the Bauhaus that people talk about now that weren't really accurate? Yeah. uh, So first and foremost, that it wasn't an architecture school. You know, I mean, most people think it was and it was not taught there. Architecture wasn't taught there until 1927. And once it was taught there, it was one of many things that was taught there. In the last iteration in Berlin under Mies van der Rohe, it was pretty much an architecture school. Uh, mm-hmm. Lili Reich, who was his collaborator, yes. uh, taught interior architecture mostly. And it was much smaller. It was a private school at that point. So I think that's a misconception. It's much bigger than people realize that there were 1,253 people there is news to pretty much everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I guess also that it's not a style, I think, is a misconception. Yes. They definitely thought of it. I, historically, we can look back and, of course, we can see elements of a style. It changes over time as well. But They were interested in it much more as a method. So uh, Marianne Brandt, in one of her only published texts on how she worked, she she was very upset that the the metal workshop under her direction was accused by the uh, Russian artist Noam Gabo that that they were making a style. He this he was uh-huh. say, said this dismissively of them, and she said, "We are not making a style. We are you know everything is made to function as it should." So. For example, if we make a teapot, it had better not drip. Our lights are designed a certain way to provide the best lighting for what their job is. So, you know, everybody now talks about Bauhaus style, but the Bauhaus members themselves would have been horrified at that. And I'd say lastly, the fact that it was a whole bunch of men, that's that's definitely... You know, not Not the case. Yeah. And I think, you know, I I mentioned that the women had a harder time in the school. I think the historians have been just as much or more to blame. You know, when you go back to the archive, those women were respected by their peers. They also had a harder time than under Nazism getting out or sort of getting by. But uh, still, they during the period of the school, a lot of them thrived in the context of the school. And a lot of them continued working afterwards. And we've just written them out of history. It's it bugs me that 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 art history and architecture history are, you know, we only look to these men as geniuses and the women are just kind of there. And oh, they were doing that, too. But it was probably derivative if some anybody mentions them at all. Well, you've done a great job in these books of profiling these women and pulling together their histories and what they accomplished and some photos. I'm sure they were hard to get of some of these people. Um, It's really fantastic. Thanks. So my last question is, what do you think is going on now that's going to be considered to be like the Bauhaus in 2120? Is there a place on the planet that's doing something that's so cool slash controversial slash something that a future researcher is going to be writing some books about it? 
I may have stumped the band here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I don't work on contemporary art schools. Uh -huh. So, I mean, certainly I've, because I've traveled around and seen some programs, seen some, I, I was just at uh, Montreal and it's this organization called Milieu with an X at the end, you know, like plural. And it's a part of, I think it's the University of Montreal. Okay. But it's a really great kind of, Center for creating interdisciplinary, also highly technological arts. So they have a really cool weaving studio that is often like these are responsive fabrics that will know when they need to light up or they'll do all kinds of really cool stuff. So does somebody hate them and want to ban them? Because that seems like a prerequisite, yeah, you know, no, in these stories. No, we'll have to go and like demonstrate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, when I teach Bauhaus, in some ways I'll say like Target or Ikea is, is kind of part of what the Bauhaus dream is because the idea was not to make fancy objects that sell for hundreds of thousands dollars. of dollars now, but to bring modernity home for everyone. The average person. So that life would be easier, that you wouldn't be encumbered by things that were hard to clean because they had so many doodads on them. You just have simple, nice things and you could live your life and move on from there. Um, so, you know, that's where I see the Bauhaus idea as succeeding. But I think there will always be the radical, weird fringe. You know, I went to Oberlin College and... Oh, well, that's the epicenter of, you know, all things right there, right? Right. I mean, I think there are a lot of, you know, it's a utopian community and there have yeah. been a lot, you know, the Oneida colony in upstate New York mm -hmm. was famously weird and a, a free love community in the 19th century. Right. Religious free love community. Yes. Um, so I Free love with rules. <laughs> We love with rules, yes. And architecture. I mean, they uh -huh. they built this big, beautiful house to live in as one married family. And I, I think there will always be, you know, little communes or, or big communes or just life experiments that really should be celebrated. And somebody should protest them so that the others of us <laughs> will pay attention. But, um, you know, I hope those kinds of things keep going. Well, Libby, you've been delightful. Thanks for stopping by. Fun to talk to you, George. George was talking with Libby Otto, co-author of Bauhaus Women, A Global Perspective. And now, a moment of reflection from Nietzscheha. Beauty, love, durability, designed to last for years to come, bringing you peace and tranquility. You feel relaxed knowing your house can easily achieve any exterior look and any color wood concrete your house loves feeling this good and you love feeling this good Nietzsche 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 say it with me Nietzsche advanced engineering Nietzsche Nietzsche durability Textures, finishes, and colors. Visit Nietzsche.com slash US Modernist. Nietzsche, Nietzsche, Nietzsche. That's in I C H. Jane Hall is a founding member of the London Architecture Collective Assemble, who won the Turner Prize in 2015. Her research looks at the legacy of modernist architects in both Brazil and the UK, and she is also author of the book Breaking Ground, Architecture by Women, featuring 180 buildings by female architects. While showcasing well-known women like Zaha Hadid, the book also covers lesser-known architects that lack coverage in Western media, or who have worked in husband and wife teams, like Mies van der Rohe's collaborator Lily Reich and Charles Eames' partner Ray Eames. 
Let's go now poolside to the U.S. Modernist Compound in Palm Springs. So where do you hail from? Where do you, were you born? Um, I'm from southeast London mm-hmm. in the UK. In the UK? Yep, and I've been based there pretty much my whole life. Southeast London is where exactly? What's the neighborhoods around there? Uh, Lewisham, Greenwich, okay. where the Millennium Dome was. Oh, yes, the Millennium Dome, yeah, right. Those kind of architectural gems. Yeah, that was a big, as they used to say, controversy in it, the UK. It, it, it was at the time, yeah. It's a sort of Richard Rogers masterpiece. Yeah. We've had a few more controversies, <laughs> architectural controversies in London <laughs> since then. So. <laughs> now it's an old favorite. Everyone loves it. Yeah, I'm sure. Isn't that funny how that works out? Yeah, 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 totally. It's a really significant bit of the skyline now. And you're here at Modernism Week giving a talk on... My book, Breaking Ground, mm-hmm. which was published by Fiden um, at the end of 2019. And it's a book about that profiles buildings built by women, architects, since 1900 to the since present 1900. day. Since 1900. And I was looking through, they, they sent me a copy of the book. Oh, great. And it seems like there was kind of a, a golden age there of these women, particularly like 50s, 60s, 70s, right in there. And then it changed for some reason. So tell me about first the golden age part. And then secondly, <laughs> what kind of shifted in the 70s and 80s? Um, the post-war period is really significant. And I think it can be kind of described as a golden age in part because um, building, making of architecture really tied into the welfare state and the kind of recreation of new ways of living. So the welfare state is very particular to kind of UK context, but you see this replicated elsewhere in the world, in um, Latin America, in Mm -hmm. North America, um, where people were kind of really thinking about social politics in relation to the built environment. And um, women were really brought into that. I think the Second World War was really a moment when women could be professionals. Um, They, you know, they're brought in to kind of really help towards the war effort. And that continued um, throughout the 50s and 60s. And a lot of people, when they came back from the war, went to art school. So you get kind of architects working with artists and a lot of women involved in those sort of relationships. Um, Particularly within the 50s and 60s, it's really husband and wife teams. Mm -hmm. Um, And the book has a lot of people like Alison Smithson and Jane Drew. Jane Drew was building Chandigarh with... Uh, Maxwell Fry yeah. and Le Cabousier and really pioneering and leading those teams. Uh, MJ Long built the um, British Library with Colin St. John Wilson and was part of his office. So it's also, really? yeah, it's also a moment when um, the kind of office was changing, the dynamics. It was no longer the kind of single male author. It was these much broader practices with young architects who are really eager to really contribute to this building effort. Um, and you can trace through the archives, um, MJ Long's, it's MJ Long's design, which, which you can trace through all the iterations for the British Library, and she project-led it. Um, but because it's a project that took 30 years to complete, her contribution is kind of lost in the, the kind of ongoing history of the building. So that, that, I think, really defines the sort of the golden age. And it was also where discourse became a really important bit, part of architectural practice. So you have architects like Lena Bobardi, who in Brazil sets up Habitat magazine um, Mm. to really talk about what Brazilian architecture should be in the post-war period and the influence of modernism um, within the kind of culture of Latin American history. And so she gets into all sorts of fights with Oscar Niemeyer, who's obviously doing this sort of much more sculptural white modernism and she's very sort of critical of it as not being somehow kind of authentic to, yeah. to the northeast of Brazil, the history of um, the slave trade. And in this sort of post-colonial context, she's really exploring the role that architects have in creating an architecture that is more inclusive. And she brings over Max Bill from Switzerland, who, who kind of weighs in on this. But she really gives a voice to Oscar Niemeyer. She's not just criticising, she's creating a space for these discussions to happen. Mm -hmm. She very much has her position, but she kind of engages productively with these sort of much more famed male counterparts who are... And this is all whilst three or four years before Brasilia is commissioned. Oh, okay. You know, that kind of... Niemeyer really gets running with his architecture. It's more of a kind of... He really sort of takes the lead with that, and that's become very well known. And Lena really represents this kind of other side uh, of Brazilian modernism, which makes her really important and probably one of the only independently practicing female architects that Brazil sort of has historically. Even though there are lots of other women working, she's become the most visible. And so that's very much a kind of Latin 
okay. part of the post-war period. There's Minette de Silva in Sri Lanka, um, who did a lot of really interesting stuff. And there are photographs of her at CM conferences in Europe, having a laugh with Le Corbusier. So oh, wow. you see all of these photos of these giants of modern architecture looking very serious in these post-war conferences. And then the sort of one image of him laughing is with, with Minette de Silva, dressed in sari. There's a movie from several years ago called Hidden Figures, ah. which is about the NASA space effort. Ah, okay. And how there were several black women mathematicians who were in the background, yeah. who did the computations that made much of the space program possible. And I think of that about your talk. You're talking about a number of these women that were not in the spotlight, but made a number of these buildings possible. Yeah, I think the history of um, modernism is very much produced in the mainstream from a kind of Western, through a Western lens. Mm -hmm. And that's why, uh, you know, Charles and Ray Eames and Ting... Jane Drew, Alison Smithson, all very well known. But it feels like there's a kind of interest and revival in women's roles in architecture. And that's a really great opportunity to kind of look at these other spaces and other parts of the world where um, the architecture is kind of just as strong, but it's mm -hmm. just a different story of modernism that isn't yeah. necessarily talked about as much. And that helps recuperate um, the sort of stories and narratives of women from other cultures and other parts of the world. Did women in the mid-century tend to succeed more as independents or when they were husband and wife teams? What was better as a woman to be in as, in a position like that? Um, de definitely within a husband and wife team okay. seemed to be the way to, um, to build more and more frequently get clients on board. I think you have people like Eileen Gray um, and Flora Rushat Roncati who are very well known individually but who I think relied a lot on independent wealth mm -hmm. <laughs> and a kind of more privileged background. So okay. I think it was easier to succeed if you were in a married couple, Alison Smithson and Peter Smithson from, from the northeast of England, um, from quite sort of modest backgrounds. So it feels like through looking at the sort of couples who are working together, that sort of support they had with each other, particularly because they could um, support each other with childcare. So oh, right. I think it's very much sort of taken for granted today when um, you think about these couple teams that um, women were treated more equally. But Peter Smithson uh, took on equal responsibility for raising their three children. And there are these amazing projects that they did where their three children authored some of the designs. Oh. And Alison Smithson wrote very angry letters to the Serpentine Museum in London when their designs were rejected for not being professional. Oh. And she writes back saying, I'm really sorry, but you're going to have to include them in the <laughs> professional display because these are very serious. And right. it's, it's actually a design done by their kids. So family life could become part of your practice if you were in a couple, whereas I think it's much harder for women working independently to be able to balance that. And so you don't see as many of them. Many of them. Did you ever run into Edgar and Margaret Hunter? No. They were very well known in the New Hampshire, Vermont area. Ah, okay. Uh, designing ski villages and entire neighborhoods of modernist houses. Oh, nice. And then when the work ran out, they moved to North Carolina, where I'm from, mm -hmm. and set up a practice there and built a really astonishing modern house for themselves that she primarily designed that is gone now. Uh, but they're a great couple to, yeah, uh, yeah, for you to yeah, look up. Yeah, yeah. Um, what the book really tries to do is understand that we can celebrate individuality and individual authorship even when that's part of a team. So mm -hmm. the book obviously only just highlights the, the women as part of these marital unions um, and points to, in the small uh, biographies included, who the male counterpart was. But the buildings featured are credited to the women. They're credited to Ray Eames. They're credited to that half of the union. And I think that's really important looking at a contemporary practice when you have these kind of huge architectural firms where collaboration is understood to be more part of the delivery of buildings mm -hmm. that we can still say this woman was involved. We can credit individuals for architecture, even if we're trying today to move away from the architect right. ideology. And uh, I think that shift towards recognizing more pluralistically authorship has been really great but also has been a way of not seeing women because now we we say that's unfashionable and we don't want to point out women yeah. because that would be why would we point out anyone um and so this book felt really important to actually be like no we're going to stop and pause here and point to this bit of history and say 
a woman, MJ Long, can take full credit for the British Museum. That's yeah. okay to say. That's okay to say. Sorry, that. the British Library. Yeah, that's okay to say. <laughs> <laughs> so the book was a sort of tool to try and also open up conversations about about authorship and identities and when it's important to kind of point to those or not. How long do you think it will take, and this is just a guess, before we're just talking about architects and we're not talking about male architects or female architects? Because other professions have kind of made that jump. Like, Mm. instance, in interior design, we don't really talk about much of the differences between men and women anymore. It's just interior design, right? Yeah, I was actually I was talking to my mum about this the other week um, to do with architects and doing a book about women in architecture. She's a doctor, mm-hmm. and she said that when I found out that my grandfather was a doctor, I asked, could men be doctors? Because I'd only met her and her friends who were women. Yeah. <laughs> so I'd assumed that doctors <laughs> were women and that men, <laughs> men couldn't do this job. And I think, I think there's a more interesting question in there, which is about talking more explicitly about individual experience in architecture, whether that's conditioned by sexuality, age, race, gender, mm-hmm. um, and that the point is not to stop talking about being a woman, <laughs> um, because we have parity in many ways um, in terms of numbers. We see equal numbers of women entering the profession and studying as men all over the world. In fact, right. more women do. They then drop off when they <laughs> right they, they uh, drop into out practice, more at down a to rate. like less yeah. than thirty percent. And so there's a question around why that happens. And so talking about being a woman in architecture is really important um, to understand that. But, um, you know, not all women are the same. And so there are many structural issues that affect women differently. And so um, experiences can just really colour the ability to stay and have a successful practice. And mm-hmm. so if anything, I, should, I think we should be talking more about being women, we should talk more about being men, we should talk more about being from different parts of the world, have, having different politics and life experiences, and understand that our identity is very much part of the architecture that we produce, in part because, um, you know, the profession should look as diverse as the people that it builds for. Um, and if we try and collapse all that by wanting to just kind of have this dumb label of architect, then we don't have those interesting con- discussions. And then all of those um, unconscious biases will just keep, um, you know, they'll always be the kind of strongest voice. So, yeah. Are we mature enough to do that <laughs> as a people? I'm like, can we handle those kinds of conversations? I'm wondering, like, can we do it? Um, I think increasingly, I think actually, you know, why this book has come out now is that our mainstream publishers are recognizing that there's a broader movement um, where women's voices across all sorts of media platforms and professions are being heard, um, not necessarily always for the right reasons, but it's definitely a kind of moment. Um, And in the research for the book, what I found incredibly interesting is how many groups, young groups of people are forming in uh, using a kind of more activist sort of register to campaign for women in architecture. And they are groups like Black Females in Architecture in London. Mm -hmm. There's a group here called Black Women in Architecture, um, women in architecture, just generally a group in Italy called Architetti. Um, you know, they're all forming individually to campaign for greater representation and visibility of women. But they're also creating platforms um, to create a kind of form of solidarity for architects um, in the profession who have different identities and and might need maybe more um, of a sort of support system that represents mm-hmm. them more specifically than just this sort of blanket women okay. in architecture. So. I don't know if it's a generational thing that actually maybe a younger generation are interested in this conversation and are having it. There's, I think, definitely a generational divide, which we discovered when inviting people to be part of the... All the boomers, right? All the boomers. (laughs) (laughs) Love the boomers. You know, and I I think that's another strand of it is creating um, intergenerational conversations Mm -hmm. because, you know, the 70s and 80s particularly were a really important part of the women's liberation movement globally and um, a kind of lot has been learnt and needs to, you know, that education needs to be more explicitly, I think, kind of passed on for, for younger groups who are exploring these issues. 
Um, well, we're still trying to pass the Equal Rights Amendment in the United States really? after 45 some years <laughs> oh, wow, now. Yeah. It's going to take us a it's little while. It's a forwards while. and backwards process. That's yeah. why I kind of think of this book as I've had a lot of interest in it and people are like, wow, I've, I've so many people I didn't know about, but have you included this person? You mm-hmm. know, everyone has their one person they want to see in right. the book. And it had to be a massive edit down to 150. So there are just a few obvious names that actually for various reasons aren't aren't in there. And... Um, you kind of realize how much people are ex- expectations of what they want to see. Um, and so in a way, I've, I, I kind of don't care who's in the book. It's just this dumb object to be like, right. women, we're here. <laughs> <laughs> we're um, not going to kind away. Of just like hit people over the head with. So um, in some ways, content isn't the most interesting thing about this book as a project in terms of what I hope it can contribute to um, a kind of discursive field about women in architecture. Um, but as an object, it's kind of been amazingly produced with incredible images that I think just really highlights how much great architecture is in the world. Mm-hmm. And for many reasons, it's not seen because it's had a woman architect okay. um, attached to it. And so I think you could flick through it and not know it's a book about women architects. You know, you just see all these amazing buildings right. and be like, wow, this incredible selection of, of architecture. Of architecture. Yeah. Now, other than Patrick Schumacher, who is Aww. the heir apparent to Zaha Hadid? Who is the woman that is oh, wow. like leading in the globe <laughs> now? Um, I think it depends who you're asking. You uh-huh. know, from a British context, there are some really incredible women um, working in the UK, from kind of Amanda Levitt, who just did a lot of stuff at the Victoria and Albert Museum. Okay. Um, in in America, it seems like Jeannie Gang, Jeannie Gang, sweeping of yes. up everything. She yes. seems to be. <laughs> Such a strong and interesting um, voice. And then there are people like Frida Escobedo uh-huh. uh, from Mexico. Carla Giosaba from Brazil okay. is really exciting. Um, so there are lots of people internationally, but I don't think anyone's going to usurp Zaha Hadid. <laughs> well, give <laughs> some queen. time. I mean, you know, <laughs> give it a little time. There's always somebody yeah. coming up. What I think is really important about Zaha is that her architecture isn't for everyone. Mm-hmm. And I think the politics of her architecture is quite problematic, but it does feel like there's such kind of respect for her architecture and her as an architect, but also the practice that she's created, that that even after she's passed away, she's created such a culture that can continue to create um, Zaha's architecture. Right. Which I think, you know, makes her a sort of one-woman movement in a way, which is just really impressive. Oh, yes, and the buildings that are coming out of that firm now continue to be... Mm. most impressive all over the world. It's hard to keep track of them. <laughs> well, they're like over 300 people working away in central London. It's, so like, uh, it's like looking them out. at Bjarke Ingels group <laughs> who seems to be launching yeah. a new building a week yeah. somewhere in the world. Well, and to Bjarke is really interesting because I'm not sure how much he's really done for women in architecture, but um, his, I think, head finance person is a woman. Yes, his um, CEO. Yeah, exactly. And so... The thing that I think is also a limitation of the book that we've created is that it focuses on architecture mm. um, and doesn't necessarily recognize that uh, lots of people are involved in that kind of back end, back of house um, form of practice, especially people around kind of finances and HR, but also marketing, and marketing but also directors who set up a firm with this kind of creative Project ambition. Yeah, and then end up in more managerial roles. And it was quite difficult to persuade a lot of women to allow us to feature works of architecture in the book that come from their practice, Hmm. but they weren't the project architect on because Mm -hmm. they felt that they hadn't had any specific contribution to to the creative expression. And then kind of getting into these conversations about how just creating the practice in the first place and sustaining it as as an employer (laughs) facilitates design to kind of just simply take place and that that's really also part of what creating architecture is about. So, yeah, it's like another way of thinking about authorship in the production of a building. And women's roles are recuperated massively when you start to kind of expand it like that. Now, this is your first time in Palm Springs? Yeah, first time here. So what do you think so far? I I mean, it's amazing. I've never (laughs) seen... We drove through the mountains on the way in, and it was very hard to keep the car on the road, just sort of like looking everywhere at this unfolding landscape. Um, The scale is so impressive. And have you driven through... Palm Canyon and all the, the buildings and the main drag there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Seen We've that? Been, been down there. Went all the way out to In-N-Out Burger at Thousand oh, Palms at that, sunset yesterday. Yes. That is American a, a cultural quest. experience. Absolutely. What did you order? 
just a, well, I've heard there's a secret menu. There but, is. Yes. Yeah, no, we were too shy. We were very you were British. Too shy? We were British about it. We were like, we'll just have a cheeseburger, please. <laughs> Next time, I'm gonna have something to come back for. You didn't dare to use the secret menu options. Yeah, no, no. So my my friend was like, no, someone's got cheesy fries over there. Yeah, with um, like a chili sort of sauce oh, wow. on it. It's really quite good. You can look it up on the internet. That yeah, that's what we should have done. We shouldn't have yeah. just gone there. You probably have time. You could go back. If you need to. <laughs> that Saturday afternoon, so it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but when you drive down to downtown, you'll see a Kentucky Fried Chicken mm-hmm. that is in a. A modernist kind of building. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. That was, this happened 25 years ago. But it, one of the most unusual things about this town is that the commercial side of it tends to favor modernism as well, mm-hmm. which you just don't see in you many don't, places. Yeah, totally. Normally it's either just houses or big cultural institutions. Yeah. But to be having your big McBucket in, <laughs> inside a yeah, really nice sort of building of... is. It's quite different. Bush hammered brutalism. <laughs> the um, Palm Springs Art Museum was incredible. That mm-hmm. was a real highlight, just sitting in the sculpture garden, just kind of looking at all the details and the materiality. It's just like we don't have that kind of attention to yeah. detail, I think, anymore. Well, I hope you have a great time while you're here, and Thanks thanks for much. coming by. Cheers, yeah. That was Jane Hall chatting with George. She's the author of Breaking Ground, Architecture by Women. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned as we bring more shows from 2020's Modernism Week in Palm Springs. You want to hang out with us at the swanky U.S. Modernist Compound at Modernism Week in February 2021? Email george at usmodernist.org. U.S. Modernist is underwritten by nichiha.com slash usmodernist and by Angela Roll. Your special agent for modernist houses, 919-995-0550. All right, take us out, George. Visit usmodernist.org's massive archives to listen to our past shows, discover documentation of 7,000 significant modernist houses, and access over 2.8 million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studio in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song was performed by me and Robinson Earl. Carrie Cesarino researches guests while juggling two children, a bowling ball, a chainsaw, and salsa dancing with husband Adam. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Modernist Archive, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm George Smart, and there's no Frank Sinatra tune I won't dance to by his pool in Palm Springs. We'll be back soon with another Fly Me to the Moon, The Way You Look Tonight, I've Got You Under My Skin edition of U.S. Marnish Radio. Cheers. <laughs>